Well, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. And we have, we, so this is the, I think the third of the series. I think there's one more after this. And today we're gonna to be talking about grain drying, storage and farm safety. Uh, so I'm Sam Markell, I'm the interim ANR director, co-interim ANR director for a probably pretty defined short period of time here since we're interviewing two candidates. Um, we have two people with us. Ken Hellebang is a professor and extension agricultural engineer. So Ken has been a specialist for 42 years. So he's got a lot of experience. He also took one for the team as a, as a department head for three years and a few months as an ANR director before Muhammad and I. So he's done a lot of service work in there. We really appreciate that. He also, for those of you at Big Iron, the what was it, Ken? The best small indoor exhibit award, I think. That's right. Yeah. So Ken was involved with that. Angie was there the whole time too. So so Ken will talk first, and he's going to talk about some harvesting and drying for maybe 20, 25 minutes. We'll have a QA and then they'll switch to Angie. And Angie was a county agent for seven years, and now she's the ranch and farm and ranch safety coordinator. Did I get that right, Angie? Yeah, so then she'll talk about some of the safety issues that we face again, maybe, you know, 20 more minutes or so and have another Q&A. So that's what that's what today will be done. We we will at 1115 will stop promptly or shortly before, depending on the questions. So, Ken, if you want to and Scott Swanson's with us. So if you have any technical issues, Scott's your guy. So, Ken, why don't you go ahead and take it away? OK, well, good morning, everyone. And. Uh, as hopefully you can see my slides, I'm being a good extension person, I say that I can't talk without slides. Uh, so we're gonna focus uh, on kind of the harvest and drying situation uh, for corn, soybeans and sunflower. Uh, and I titled it October of 2022, uh, I frequently will tell farmers and others that I, when I'm doing presentations that I like to cover the fundamentals because each year is different. Each year gives us challenges. And so if we look at uh, this year, uh, as of the crop and report yesterday, uh, things are, are moving along. Uh, I always watch the, the crop report uh, as we go through the growing season because I try to use that then to give me a signal of what I need to be covering for harvest and, and drying and storage. And then uh, it gives me uh, an idea of where we're at, particularly this year with our late uh, planting. But because of the warm temperatures, we've pretty much caught up. Uh, so what I've got on the slide is this year's September 2022 versus the five-year average. And we, when we look at corn maturity, we're about 26%, uh, pretty close to normal. Soybean leaf drop, 57% versus 72 for a five-year average. Uh, but soybeans will, will change quickly. Uh, and then if we look at sunflower, uh, we're at about 30% versus 34. So again, pretty typical conditions. But I always uh, say that reaching maturity is, is just the first step in the process. Uh, corn, for example, has about a 35% moisture content once it reaches maturity. And of course, we don't want to be harvesting 35% moisture. And so then we start thinking about what is the dry down. Uh, and for soybeans, that's not as big of an issue typically because uh, they dry fairly rapidly as long as we have decent drying conditions. Actually, um, there's potential for it to get too dry. And, and we'll talk some about that. So what's, what are we looking at? Uh, I always look at the uh, weather forecasts, uh, trying to look at what, what are we gonna be dealing with? Is it a 
dry harvest? Is it a wet harvest and it can start out wet and get dry or vice versa? The eight to 14 day temperature outlook is in the top left corner uh, up in this area here. And it looks like we're gonna be above normal temps. And even if you look at the, the 10 day forecast that, that the weather service and other places put out, uh, looks like we'll have no trouble reaching maturity uh, as we finish off this growing season. But when we look at October, we're continuing to be, it says, potentially above normal temperatures. Uh, the central part of the country has got a much higher probability, but uh, probably but their guess as of right now is that October is gonna continue the trend that we've had. Uh, when you start looking beyond that, then we get equal chance of above normal, normal uh, conditions. And so that always worries me a little bit that as we get to November, uh, that things might be turning the other way. And that's why we start seeing uh, a change in that pattern. If we look at precipitation, we're gonna continue to be dry for the eight to 14. But as we start looking, into October, then we're at equal chance of being above or below, which I say ends up putting us pretty much at uh, a normal probability. And that means that we could be wet, we could be dry. Uh, and that's a challenge. And if we start looking at even the, the seasonal, which is October, November, December, we're trending to that equal chance again. Um, and so even though temperatures are looking pretty good, uh, precipitation as we start getting into October is, is less certain. Okay, if we get normal temperatures and conditions, uh, how rapidly will, will the grain dry down? And we'll focus first on corn. Uh, and this table uh, includes a number of different factors related to that dry down. Uh, we'll skip September and just look at October. If we're looking at uh, the first column here, uh, it says 16% moisture. So that's the moisture content uh, that would be potentially the, the ending moisture content if we had good drying conditions. So that's favorable. Number of uh, primarily agronomy focused people look at growing degree days and try to make a, a prediction off of that. I just was on and looked at uh, Pioneer, for example, they have where they say it takes about 30 to 45 growing degree days to take off a point of moisture. If you look at that predictor, that would only say we would dry four to 5% during the month of October, and that's not reality. And so I've, if you hear people talking about growing degree days and how it correlates with, with dry down, um, I wouldn't listen too intently to that. Iowa State University has put together a calculator uh, that's on the web. You just do a search for uh, Iowa State University dry down calculator, and it uh, has you put in the moisture, existing moisture content and the, the date and it'll calculate a, a prediction based on weather uh, conditions over hi historically weather conditions. And if we use that model, it'll show that we would expect maybe about a 14% moisture reduction during the month of October. So if we're starting out at 35, that would say that we would be at about 21 percent moisture at the end of October. 
I've used a prediction where I go to the North Dakota Agricultural Weather Network and look at potential evapo transpiration, which is what we use to calculate irrigation needs in the summertime. Uh, it takes into consideration temperature, wind, solar radiation, relative humidity, et cetera. I think it's a, a good way of making a prediction. And depending on year and where you're at in the state, we're probably looking at about three inches of water removal uh, based on that PET. That would then translate into drying of about 11 to 12%, not quite as optimistic as the Iowa State one. And I'll say we're looking at maybe two and a half or at most three percentage points of moisture removal um, during the month of October. So likely, unless we're harvesting very high moisture corn, a lot of corn is going to need the whole month of October to dry. As we shift to November, unfortunately, uh, we look at the equilibrium moisture content or that field moisture increasing. Uh, the amount of moisture removal is almost nil. We'll maybe pick up a point a week. And so uh, my typical recommendation is that we need to be planning to harvest corn the latter part of October, early November, because pretty much the drying is done at that point. If we look at uh, following that moisture content, we're gonna be using a moisture meter to uh, measure that grain moisture content. Keep in mind though, that the meters are calibrated for 15% moisture corn. And as the moisture gets higher, it's more in air. So if you're checking 25% moisture corn, uh, it's probably, as much as a point or more off at that point. Also, we need to be adjusting for temperature. Uh, we start harvesting corn in November when we have temperatures that are uh, below 40 degrees. Most of the meters are not going to allow you to take a reading or will give you an inaccurate reading below 40 degrees. Also, they are sensitive to moisture variations across the kernel. So I really encourage people to take and, and do that initial moisture measurement, put the corn in a sealed container like a, a Ziploc bag or something, give it six to 12 hours to equilibrate to room temperature, uh, and then recheck that moisture content just to make sure that we're getting an accurate reading. I don't anticipate a lot of use of bags this year, uh, but if, if some are using uh, the poly bags for corn storage, uh, that corn needs to be dry. If we're in the 25 to 35% moisture range, that corn will go through the the ensiling silage making process, which we don't want for most of our, our corn. Uh, in the 15 to 24% moisture range, uh, we're gonna have heating and spoilage uh, unless we're at winter temperatures. If we can consistently stay below 30 degrees, then we may get by at those higher moisture contents. But essentially the corn or grain needs to be dry going into the bag if we're gonna be safely using the bag. In addition to moisture content, uh, sometimes we'll get people thinking, well, it's a sealed container and so that will prevent mold growth uh, or prevent insect activity. Both of those are false. Uh, we recommend running the bags north and south so that we get even solar heating on the two sides. Uh, and keep in mind the uh, 
the temperature of the grain will be whatever the average outdoor temperature is. So the bags work well for winter storage, but if we're storing into spring, it really needs to be dry. There's lots of variations or options for high temperature drying. Uh, and I've just included a, a collection of different dryers on the slide. Uh, there is a presentation on my website on the different types of dryers. And I could, if someone has an interest, uh, I could do a, an hour presentation just on uh, the different characteristics of the different high temperature dryers. One of the things though that, that frequently comes up is what is the cost to dry? And if we're strictly looking at the energy, uh, most of our dryers, high temperature dryers, drying corn, we'll be looking at uh, about 2,500 BTUs of heat required to evaporate a pound of water. And we can then use that information to calculate uh, what that cost would be. We take uh, the multiplier of 0 0.022 times whatever the propane price is, and that gives us the cost per bushel point of moisture removal. Some of the newer uh, dryers that include the more energy efficiency features might be down closer to 2000 BTUs. Uh, and then that conversion factor is 0 0.018. But for example, if we had a dollar per gallon propane, we take that times 0 0.02 is kind of an in-between number between the two. Uh, and that shows us about two cents per bushel per point. And it, it's a straight linear relationship. So if propane is $2 a, a gallon, uh, we'd be looking at four cents per bushel per point of moisture removed. Now that's strictly just the, the cost of the propane. It doesn't include all the other associated costs that are involved. If we look at uh, trying to calculate how much propane is actually being used, uh, the, there's a fairly simple formula for that as well. Again, 0 0.02 times the bushels that we're drying times the point of moisture removal. So if we're drying a thousand bushels and we're taking off 10 points of moisture, that amounts to about 200 gallons of propane. So one of the things they've been talking about for this fall is that you make sure that you have your propane uh, contracted or available so that when it comes time to do the drying, maybe in, in late October, early November, that uh, we know how much propane that we're likely going to be using. Particularly in some of the newer areas where they're growing corn for uh, the first times, uh, guys will try to get by with using natural air drying where we're just moving the air through the bin. If we're doing that, the maximum moisture that we can handle is about 21% moisture. Uh, we need an airflow rate of at least one cubic foot per minute per bushel. Uh, and I'll show you on the next slide that, that that works okay in October, but not November. So typically what we're doing is, is cooling the corn and holding it wet over winter and then doing the drying in the spring. And we'll normally recommend when outside temperatures are averaging above 40 degrees is when we start that uh, natural air drying. Lots of numbers on this uh, table. What I want to focus on is here the, the November uh, row that because of the cooler temperatures, we start looking at very little moisture holding capacity in the air. And we're looking at 70 days of fan time 
to do the drying. Uh, and even if we start adding heat, a lot of guys think, well, I'll just go out and buy a heater and warm the air. Um, and if we heat the air 10 degrees, it does shorten that drying time a little bit, but we also end up over drying the corn. We're now down at 12 and a half percent moisture and it's still taking 51 days of, of drying time. So pretty much I say that uh, natural air drying just does not work in November. Spring drying works very well. Again, like I said, starting when temperatures are averaging uh, 40 degrees and warmer, uh, we're still looking at uh, 40 to 50 days of fan time, but it will dry that corn down as long as we're starting at that 20, 21% moisture. Every year uh, we have a few bin roofs that, that they are damaged because as the air goes through the grain, it picks up moisture. If the temperature is at or below freezing, it'll ice those uh, gooseneck vents open over. The screens on those just uh, seal up tight. So anytime we're running fans at temperatures near or below freezing, I recommend leaving the fill and access door open as a pressure relief valve. Otherwise, it's just going to pop that bin roof up and, and damage it. Let's shift gears and talk briefly on soybeans. Um, optimum moisture is about 13% moisture. One of the characteristics of soybeans is that they change moisture very rapidly. And so uh, everyone is familiar with it might be 15% moisture in the morning and by a warm, dry afternoon, we might be down to 11%. And the amount of breakage that occurs, the damage to the beans and the field loss, shelling in the field uh, go up as we start getting moisture contents below 13. So uh, the farmers really need to be uh, doing whatever they can to harvest as much as they can at, at that 13% moisture. If we get into a situation where we get rain showers coming through, uh, some years it, it's very difficult to get the soybeans dry out in the field. We can run them through a high temperature dryer, but we have to limit the drying temperature. And we're still going to end up with some breakage and damage going through the dryer. The other characteristic of soybeans are that we have a significant fire hazard because the pods and other trash that, that it goes through the dryer tends to become lodged and then over dried and, and becomes tender. <laughs> and so um, they need to keep the grain flowing. We need to keep the dryer clean. We may need to be uh, monitoring that dryer continuously and cleaning it uh, maybe a couple times a day. Those that are familiar with sunflower know that the sunflower fires are uh, part of drying sunflower. Uh, too many times, though, people think it's related to the drying temperature. Again, it's a housekeeping issue. It's dependent on the uh, cleanliness of the dryer. And so maybe with sunflower, we need to be cleaning that dryer two and even three times a day. We need to be monitoring it to make sure that that the flowers are continuing to flow through. If a fire does start, shut the fan off, uh, use an extinguisher to, to attack where the, the fire is, and then empty the dryer to make sure that any of the, of the uh, embers that might still be glowing uh, are removed. We gotta keep in mind that sunflowers are an oil product and, and both with 
soybeans and particularly with sunflower, we end up with an oil fire. Some again, try to use natural air drying. Uh, I really discourage anything over 15% moisture. Uh, and again, it works well in October, as long as we have adequate airflow. Um, and this comes out of my publication, uh, Natural Air, Low Temperature Grain Drying. And you can see uh, different airflow rates and drying times required to, to get it done in October. But as we look at November, uh, same kind of table as before, uh, we shift into November and all of a sudden our drying times become very excessive. And um, we, with sunflower, uh, with just a little bit of heat, we can successfully dry in about a month as long as we have adequate airflow. And so a little more optimistic uh, conditions for sunflower. Well, getting a dry is just part of it. Then we have to manage it uh, and the types of things that, that we need to do are monitor temperature, moisture, insects, mold. Uh, I recommend at least every two weeks, uh, except during the extreme cold of winter. Uh, and manage means to direct with a degree of skill. So we need to have some expertise on how to manage the bin. We need to be controlling temperature, moisture, and insects. Many years ago, I put this visual together to, to show the uh, temperature bands for insects. The curve line is the uh, average monthly temperature in North Dakota. We recommend aerating the grain whenever it's uh, 10 to 15 degrees cooler outside. And then we uh, end up trying to keep it cool as we go through the summer. If somebody has questions or wants some of these, I still have some of them on. And lots of technology available to help us manage that grain, but it uh, is a tool we don't want to replace uh, going in and checking the grain. There are lots of hazards associated with the grain. Um, this is kind of a lead in to Angie's portion. The one that I will touch on is a little bit on the moldy grain. Um, for years, I was telling people you need a, a mask that has two straps. Uh, as a way to really indi indicate the N95 mask. One of the things with COVID is that everybody knows now what an N95 mask is, but that's, <clears throat> excuse me, that's what we need for, for keeping those mold spores out of us. Like everybody else, just do a search for NDSU grain drying and storage and you'll find my information. And I think it's yours, Angie. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ken. You had a great, uh, great segue into, um, I mean, our work goes hand in hand together in terms of um, the, the, the safety precautions that, that we need to consider when we're looking at working um, around grain handling equipment. And so for those of you on the call, um, my name is Angie Johnson, as, as Sam shared. I am the NDSU Extension Farm and Ranch Safety Coordinator. I've been in this role for just about a year now. And so um, I, I have one year under my belt, but still so many, um, so many more opportunities and, and much more knowledge to gain. And so it's been great to to work with Ken and, and learn a lot more and, and understanding of, of what farm safety positions look like across the extension service system in, in the United States. And so it's been, it's been a really good opportunity. And I, I thank you all for your support and, and your time this morning to learn a little bit more. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just get started. Some of you may have um, seen bits and pieces of this presentation. I've, I've done a recording or two 
for you to have available during uh, pesticide training season uh, as part of a component um, within your training materials, but also for fumigation, uh, working with Andrew Thostenson, our pesticide specialist here at NDSU and, and focusing on, on how we work safely around grain bins when applying a fumigate product. And so anytime I, I give a presentation or I, I work with, with staff, it's really important to take a, just take a moment to step back because the topics that I get to talk about are, they're not easy. Uh, they're really hard conversations to have. Nobody likes to be told that they're unsafe. Not that that's what I do at all, right? I, that's, that's not our goal. We're not, we're not enforcement. We're prevention and education. But the reality is, is taking safety seriously uh, can be a challenge. And it's not that people don't want to be safe or aren't acting safe. It's just we become so comfortable with what we're doing that we take for granted the seriousness and honestly, the hazardous conditions that we do work in. And so it's really important to just take a step back. And for any of you out there, um, I, I can only imagine that that some of you have been touched in your life by someone that's been involved in some type of farmer ranch related incident. And so I always encourage growers or, or any any audience members out there that um, need to take a step back because of this heavy subject to please feel comfortable to do so. Because taking care of yourself is priority number one. I like to start off with showing this uh, humorous little clip or meme, whatever you want to call it, because I think it gets all of us to start thinking and being realistic with ourselves that for, for those that, I mean, you can just go to the local elevator or during harvest time, you can see the long line of semis uh, that are at the elevator. And so um, you know, I don't always wait in line at the green elevator, but man, when I do, it makes me want to build one more bin. And, and many of our growers have experienced that. And um, my point being is that the green industry has has changed. We're not just dealing with 5,000 bushel bins anymore. We're dealing with, you know, commercial facilities that have over a million bushel storage capacity, whether that's not just grain bins, but other confined spaces that they're using structured domes and whatnot, but our handling equipment, you know, we're using semis, semi trailers, pup trailers, um, you know, we can hold a, a, a semi can hold a, a grain cart load or more and versus the single axle trucks of, of yesteryear. And so just keeping in mind about how the grain industry has really, has really changed and how farmers are handling their storage. And with that change comes comes problems, right? Unintended um, unintended issues that we need to address, but but it's a challenge. And so one of the the reality is, uh, and why we're all here is to understand a little bit more about the problems that that come with working in confined spaces such as grain bins. And one of the biggest questions that I get asked and, and asked often, especially by the media is, well, what, what's our number one, you know, farm related injury or, or fatality? And, and the reality is folks is that it's, it's not that simple. There is no formal reporting. Um, you do not have to report if, if you have a farm injury or incident on your operation. There is no federal mandate that requires you to, to report that injury. And what that means is that we don't have a great database or, and we don't have a great understanding in terms of what we're actually seeing out in the countryside. Commercial facilities, absolutely. 10 or more employees, they have to follow OSHA regulations, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. So anytime there's a near miss incident, I mean, it has to be legally reported. And some of the best information that we can get is, is from Purdue University. Dr. My colleague, Dr. Bill Field, he has been um, working with a grant for, for many, many years that really focuses on trying to understand and get an idea in terms of what's going on with confined spaces out in the agricultural workspace. And 
Um, they have been collecting this data since 1962. And so it's a very, very large data set. And I just, I'm not gonna go through the details of these numbers with you, but I think it's important to put into perspective that grain storage facilities are, are a big, big problem when it comes to injuries and fatalities. Um, and, and what his report does is it looks at both commercial and on farms. And you might be wondering, well, Angie, you just told me that we can't, you know, there is no reporting system. We can't monitor farm related injuries. And the reality is, is, is what our uh, industry isn't the right word, but what our, what our team does is really look at news releases, media reports, social media posts. Um, there, there are a couple of networks out there that that is literally what they do is they scour and keyword search uh, different terms in order to kind of get an idea of what accidents or, in, excuse me, incidences are happening based on what the media is reporting. And I think all of us on this call realize that, well, just because a farm injury doesn't make the news um, doesn't mean it's not serious because not all farm related incidences make the news, you know, typically if 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 it's a, a fall or if, if there's survivors, it, it may not even make the news. It usually has to be a very tragic scene in order to make local media. And so just to kind of give you some framework of the reality of, of what we're dealing with, we're, we're, we have a really, really good estimate and, and some data, but it's not concrete and it's not solid. And I've been talking a lot about a confined space, and, and I don't want to make the assumption that we all know what a confined space is. That's, that's not fair, and because there's many different types of confined spaces. When you get out into our, our large feedlot operations, whether that's cattle or hogs or, or whatever a confined space working with livestock, we've got manure pits as well, and, and they classify as the confined space. And so just setting this narrative that when we're dealing with a confined space, we're dealing with a space that's not designed as a regular workspace. Like a grain bin is not a shop. <laughs> you know, this isn't a place where you can go in and grab your welder and or, or get out of the rain. I mean, it, this is not designed as that type of structure to be working in. Um, a confined space also is very limited. There's, there's not a lot of exit or entry points. And as you'll notice in this photo, they are small, okay? It's, it's not meant for, quick access. It's not meant for quick escape. It's, it's very, very small. It's meant to serve the purpose of storage, of storing grain. And then a confined space also really looks at the physical and toxics hazards, right? And so Ken was talking a little bit about molds earlier, okay? We can also have fume issues um, in terms of when those molds are happening, they produce toxins that, that get into the air and you breathe in. Uh, and can cause some serious health issues later on. And so just kind of giving you a background of, you know what, this is what we're dealing with in a confined space. And for most of us here in North Dakota, our confined space is, is related to grain bins. Uh, this is just going into the deep nitty gritty to give you a, a even deeper view of, of what a confined space is and, and really looking at, I just wanted to showcase this to get deeper into the hazards because most producers don't think about oxygen content when they're working with grain bins. I mean, oxygen can be a, a huge limiting factor and, and a problem, right? Anytime we're dealing with, with too low or too much, we, we've, like Ken talked about earlier, with dryer fires, we can actually have grain excessively heat up within a bin and get so hot that it'll, it'll combust. It can start on fire. And so just looking at the different the different true dangers that I think we take for granted um, and, and don't always get an opportunity to shed a light on because we just work with grain bins so much. We're around them so much that we don't realize, you know, in most cases we think of engulfments, but really um, some people can be overwhelmed with the, the air quality once they make that choice to, to enter a grain bin. This is looking deeper into the weeds because I think it's really important as, as agents. I know I loved seeing um, some numbers and I re it really hit home to me when I could see a little bit more about North Dakota. You know, where does my home rank 
And this is just looking at confined spaces from that Purdue report. And if anyone's interested, it's available online or I can certainly send it to you. But I always, I like to showcase this 2020 report. And for some, you're gonna say, Angie, that's so outdated, but just hang on with me, bear with me. So in 2020, there were 64 total cases of confined space incidences, okay? Of those 64 confined space incidences, 35 of them were grain entrapments. Because remember, grain bins are not the only source of, or are not the only type of confined space. So there are a lot of other, uh, mostly manure handling facilities are our other confined space. But just kind of giving you an idea um, of, of some of those detailed numbers. And I wanna ask you, where did North Dakota rank? So when you look at this map, you're going to see uh, the map of the United States, of course, but then you're going to see boxes within each state. You're going to see a gray box, and that box is going to have a number that lists the total number of confined space incidences that they have been able to report and record since about uh, 1962. That white box right next to that gray box is going to be the total number of 20 incidences that occurred in 2020 within each of those states. So when you look at that white box, you're actually going to see that North Dakota and Minnesota tied for second in the amount of confined space incidences in 2020. Okay, keep that in the back of your mind. I promise I'll, I'll dive into it a little deeper. And, and this, is a, this is a serious deal. And, and that's why you're all here today to, to learn a little bit more. And I wanna give you some confidence to be able to talk about grain bin safety when you're working with your clientele. And so I get this really cool opportunity to work with the Samford Health Trauma Center here in Fargo. Um, it, many people don't know this, but the Trauma Center in Fargo is the only level one trauma center between Minneapolis, Seattle, Denver, and Omaha, Nebraska. That's a, that's a, that scares me. And, and, and it should scare all of us because the reality is, is if we need trauma related care, we need critical, our, our individuals are in critical care. They need help now, emergency surgeries. Um, these are the only level one hospitals that they're, that are able to handle that. And so I've gotten the opportunity to look at agricultural related farm incidences um, from some of the data from Stanford. And between 2010 and 2020, there have been 292 farm injuries. Okay. And of those, 17 of them were related to grain bins. Okay. And 10 of those occurred between 2019 and 2020 alone. That just, for, for me in, in this field, that blows my mind and is, is a jaw dropper for me. And the reason why I, I keep bringing up 2020 and showing that is how many of you remember that harvest, okay? If you go back and look at end on data, that was an, an or if you have good long-term memory, that was a really, really, really wet fall. And that caused a lot of harvest challenges and this is why Ken went first in the presentation because we want to talk about if we want to prevent grain bin related incidences and fatalities, it starts with the condition of the grain going into the bin for storage. And so during that harvest period with that excess um, uh, plant moisture within those within the kernels of whatever crop, it didn't matter whether it was corn or whatnot. Um, it caused some serious storage issues moving forward. And so hence, when we had storage problems, there was more need to end up going into the bin. And digging deeper into that data, um, something that I think gets taken for granted, and I've talked to Ken a little bit about this, and we featured this topic at Big Iron, is talking about slips, trips, and falls. And so a lot of times media reports only look at or talk about grain engulfments. That's what makes the news. And, and rightfully so. It's a tragic, tragic event and extremely serious. But, but we take for granted slip trip, slips, trips, and falls are just as serious. You know, we're talking about platforms that are, my goodness, 
20 plus feet, you know, over. And so it's, it's very, very serious and, and can have life altering effects and also cause fatalities. And so of that data from our, our Sam, Samford Trauma Center, 13 of those were related, uh, 13 of those injuries were related from falls, either falling from the bin into the bin or um, falling inside the bin. And this is just, I'm not gonna go through all these numbers, but just to give you the severity of what happened. And I think it's really important to note that this data, I don't wanna say it's limited, but you'll probably notice there's a piece missing is that this does not talk about fatalities. Our Sanford data only really looks at those that made it to the hospital and were able to survive. So this does not include those that didn't make it. And again, just giving you some more demographics that it's not just one age that's targeted. We had any individuals from 18 all the way to 81 years of age. And so um, it, it's, you're not, people are not immune to it. Age, age doesn't matter. It's, it's impacting the, it, all of the producers as an industry. And so now that I've got you thinking a little bit about slips, trips, and falls, because it is something that we don't hear in the news. We, we don't hear of those reports often, but they're happening more and more than we realize. Um, what can we do to prevent that? And um, one, of, one of my favorite ways to do this, and, and Ken and I can go back and forth on this, I'm okay with that, but utilizing ground opening lids. Uh, being able to open that bin directly from the ground is is huge. I've got a hopper bin system that this is this is the platform that I have installed on all of them because I do not feel comfortable climbing that high, nor should I expect my father uh, to have to take on that endeavor if I don't want to do it. And so using ground opening lids has been a huge has been a lifesaver literally for for us in our operation. Do they solve everything? Absolutely not. Because as Ken mentioned earlier, you still have to manage. You still really need to be able to take a peek inside those bins. Um, but this gives you an opportunity that when you're climbing the bins, the lid's already open. You don't have to try and hang on to your fixed ladder and also open that bin hatch at the same time. Uh, this is the piece of safety equipment that we featured at Big Iron. I absolutely love it, love it, love it, because it 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 helps growers um, actually have a safety mechanism in place to be able to climb a fixed ladder system. So a fixed ladder is just like I it, just like it's uh, pronounced is that this ladder is bolted. It is fixed onto the side of that grain bin, and this allows a cable and pulley system to be attached to a class three harness and, and lifeline, a fall protection. So you're able to climb that bin. And for some reason, if it's, if not that you should be climbing a bin on a frosty morning, but we all know what frosty mornings, they can have that frost layer on steps, which is extremely slippery. And so if you make, make that choice to climb and, and you slip and fall, you are only going to fall as far as that fall protection will, uh, the length of that fall protection. So this is a really, really cool um, design that, that folks can have installed on their bins in order to actually have some safety protection in place when, when making those bin climbs. Uh, stairs, uh, I get a lot of conversation about stairs, which I think are fantastic. But the problem is, is that stairs do not come equipped on all grain bins, okay? Usually they are um, an additional add-on purchase. And we all know with inflation and, and the lovely situation our world is in right now, that especially any any metal, iron, you know, the, in, in this case, uh, what we're dealing with with bins, it's going to cost more. And so that will be a, a deterrent for people to install stairs is just because of the sheer cost to add it on. Um, and you'll also notice uh, in, in the photo on the right, so the stair takes us up to, to the roof of the grain bin, but how do we get to the top? Okay, You still have to climb a fixed ladder to get to the very tippy top. And so that's again, where you could have a, a, a ground opening lid installed at that point. So you're, you're able to open up that lid 
um, right at the, the top of that staircase there. And you could also have some fixed ladder fall protection installed as well. Again, the downplay is everything costs money, but at the end of the day, putting a price on, on your safety and your life, it, it shouldn't even be a question, but I realize um, it, it, it gets, it gets expensive. The other piece that we featured at Big Iron, and this is something that I would like to work with with agents more because I think it's a very, very simple but such an effective program is utilizing lockout tagout. Uh, lockout tagout is, it does not have to be complex. So basically, um, I know I've got a really busy photo on on the left side, so, so just bear with it. But the goal is, is to really shut down all of your power sources before you start doing any maintenance or, or working on your grain handling system. Like Ken mentioned, a lot of, there's tons of dryer options out there. And there's also so many different auger system, grain legs, sumps, bin sweeps. A lot of them are, are mostly powered by electrical controls. And so taking the time to completely shut it down, get to that breaker box, power it down, use that lockout clasp in the middle of, of your screen to, to go through the loop of the breaker box uh, on and off switch, and then actually taking a lock, a physical lock or a physical little tag that has, you can write your name on it, your employee's name on it, whatever it is, and, and lock it or zip tie it in that clasp. And what that lock or, or tag represents is you. It represents you as an individual that has taken the time to power down that equipment. And nobody can unlock that lock except you when you are ready to turn on and repower that equipment. So it's to help prevent someone from unintentionally coming over and say, geez, no wonder why this doesn't work. It's off. And then somebody turning it on while the other person is working on it. And um, it's something that what I, I like talking about lockout tagout because it's not just a farmer ranch related piece. This can be used for, for homeowners in, in houses and, and especially with young children around. Not that they should be around breaker boxes to begin with, but you just you just never know where where kids and children can find themselves. And so Lockout tagout, I think, is a really, really good tool that we can do a better job helping producers be able to use that tool. And this is just an example. When I was in the county, I had a producer that they utilized lockout tagout when it came to maintenance of their equipment. So that tractor, you'll notice there's the, the, the tag that is attached to the door handle of the tractor. That tag cannot be removed by any other person than, than who's listed on that board. And in this example, it'd be Trevor or Scott. They have drain, there's no hydraulic oil because they're fixing the axle seal. And so if someone were to, didn't know that and were to hop into that tractor and start it, you're gonna have some serious mechanical issues moving forward. And so they practice the lockout tagout system to protect their equipment so somebody doesn't unintentionally go in and, and operate that machine. And so if you're, if, if I think about it this way, if you're not going to do it to protect yourself, start out by thinking about that equipment and, and keeping that safe. I think it's a really good way to, to ease into it and to, to see and showcase the benefits of using it. Even if you're working by yourself, um, we always don't remember to pull the keys if we've changed the oil. But if I take time to tag out and put a tag on that cab, I'm going to remember instantly when I see it that, yep, that's right. I can't drive this. I need to, I haven't put oil back in. Shifting gears a little bit um, and, and just being cognizant of time here. Uh, I always... This role has been interesting because I've always said this and I will stand firmly behind it in the fact that my job is not regulatory. Like I am not here to hammer down rules on you, to tell you what to do. Um, and, and so people get really, 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 really anxious. And I can see the hair stand up on the back of their neck when I say the word permit. And the only reason I, I bring this up because I feel that, and I might not explain myself in the best way, so bear with me, but I feel that there are already amazing 
tips, tricks, fact sheets, whatever you want to call it. There's call it regulations. There's these amazing um, resources out there that really outline the hazards that are that are present when working with grain bins. So how can we help producers utilize the checklists, the fact sheets that are already there? And I'm not saying physical paper, that's not my point, but just being able to go through and realize like, oh my gosh, these are things that I never ever thought of because how many, how many people are ever taught on grain bin management? You know, you go to your grain bin manufacturer, they come and install it, and then it's your job to put grain in, into it. You know, there's 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 no training. So you you learn by doing. I mean, a lot of people they've they've worked with Ken and and really setting up their system. And, and so nobody's ever been taught. And I think just bringing awareness to those hazards and talking about them so then we can help people mitigate that risk. And so, you know, having that mindset, you know what? I'm not going to make a grain bin entry decision without really going through my, my checklist. Now that I know what these hazards are, have I locked out all the energy sources? Do I know what's going on with the air quality in the bin? Do I have a safety harness and a lifeline? And I've put an asterisk by that because there's, there's two, it's two separate issues. Having a safety harness versus knowing how to use it are two completely different issues. Um, and, and I could have a conversation on that all day. Um, but the other thing is, is, you know, what type of lighting do we have? Because remember, I hope this is familiar, but these are all signs pointing to we're dealing with a confined space, okay? Um, and uh, the part at the bottom talking about having, basically having that, what I call a buddy system, and guys will think, well, Jeepers, I have I have a buddy with me. They'll be able to pull me out. And for all of you out there on Zoom land, the reality is, and, and this is going to sound harsh, but the reality is, is that buddy is not there to pull you out. That buddy is there to call 911. And, and because you will not be able to react fast enough to, to grab a hold of somebody that's becoming engulfed in grain. Um, and what ends up happening is that second person try, ends up becoming the victim as well because they try and go in and, and rescue that first person. And so as cruel as it sounds, that buddy system, you need to have it. But the reality is, is they're there because they need to be ready to call 911 if, I shouldn't say if it happens, it's, it's when it happens, okay? Um, and going back, just just talking about grain bin entry, this is just specifically looking at entrapments now. Earlier, we looked at all total confined spaces. This app is, is again, from my colleagues at Purdue University, really looking at the number of entrapments in 2022. And again, North Dakota ranked second and really contributing to that, that high moisture crop that was going into the bin um during that really awful wet wet fall um and again not going to be detailed but just showing you some some different demographics of that a lot of times i'll get questions all right angie like it's just corn right i mean i don't have to worry about it i raise you know i raise flax or whatever uh, it's not my problem right and let's be real here <laughs> Grain entrapments can happen with any of the crops that we're dealing with, whether it's corn, soybeans, I mean, any, any of the crops that you see on your screen, it can happen. And the truth is of, of the documented cases that we have, remember documented, there's a lot of cases out there, it's estimated about 30% of, of farm related cases are, are not reported. Um, over 50% of those documented cases have involved corn, and that's because it's been out of condition, as, as Ken had talked a little bit about earlier, those, those pieces that lead to that. So I think it's really important when you're working with your growers that sometimes it's, it's I don't want to use the word oblivious, but just realizing like it, it happens more than, than, than just a cor people that are storing corn in bins. Um, these are the different types of entrapments. Again, this could be a whole PowerPoint on itself, so I don't want to get caught into the weeds of this. Uh, some of you have, have heard me talk about these before, and if, if for those of you that would like to learn more, I'd love to sit down with you and we can talk through these, but just wanted to go through some of these pieces 
And I added to this list storage bags. Um, I know a few years ago in Kidder County, I believe it was Kidder County, there was a very, very uh, dangerous incident that happened with the, the suction power of that, that, that polygrain bag, those storage bags. And so Ken mentioned them earlier as well, but, but they are a, definitely a, a risk for um, some entrapment situations that can occur as well. Um, this is just briefly going through, you know, looking at fl a flowing grain scenario. And I hope when all of you see that picture, I hope deep down inside you got really or a little bit angry because that person is making a horrible, horrible, horrible decision in, in doing what he's doing. There's no fall protection. You can see, clearly see the funnel cone shape of grain that's going down and, um, and, and, and that grain is horrible. I mean, you, it is in sheets. And so um, any of the, any different collapses or there could still be some open hollows or caverns underneath because of that crusting, we just have a serious situation on our hands. And so with flowing grain, I talk a lot about how the there's a suction action, right? And, and that, that suction is so strong that you physically cannot swim out of it, you know, swim your way out of it to try and pull yourself up. Um, and, and you can't, you can't walk or climb yourself out. And these are just some clips from, from Ken's publication on don't get caught in the grain, just showcasing the reality of how many seconds it can take to become engulfed and, and fully buried. And so that deals a lot with um, the, the grain demo that we got to make at fall conference last year. And so if agents are on this call that are interested in learning more about making your own demo, talk to me, I've got some supplies left over. And this is just looking at um, the the sheer amount of force, you know, gravity takes hold in those engulfment situations. And so when you're buried at certain levels, at certain depths within the grain, this is showcasing how many pounds of force it would take to be able to pull that person out. And, and I know how strong Sam Markell is, but there's no way Sam would even be able to pull um, a person, you know, using over 1500 pounds of force if they're buried that deep into the grain. So just kind of a really good picture to help reiterate the fact that that second person that's on scene can become a victim really quickly if they try and, and pull that other person out. This is just looking at bridge drain where we have that crusting on the top and, and that hollow center and we try and break that crust. And once it breaks, we can easily become entrapped into the remaining flowing grain that's taking place. Sidewall collapse. I usually think about this like an avalanche. Uh, actually at Big Iron last week, we had some students come through and they, they claimed to me that there is no way that can happen in a bin. And I said, yes, absolutely this can happen in a bin. It's because you get really, really high moisture, moldy corn that's starting to um, solidify essentially into this wall, but you'll still have free flowing pieces that once you break that crust layer, it can quickly avalanche. And now you're gonna see a scene out of a playground. I'm, I'm getting close to wrapping up here, I promise. But, you know, it's all about perspective, okay? I show this slide because to all of us looking at it, it's a pretty innocent slide, right? It's a pretty innocent ladder. Um, we take kiddos to the park all the time. And, and a lot of times these, these are the different pieces of equipment that kids get to play on. So to, to a child, this is, this is a playground. But then I ask you, well, what about this? How is this different? And so it's all about perspective and making sure that not only are we concerned about people going into the bin, but then also what are those hazards um, when, when we have kids on the farm? Because a lot of times um, our, our farm yards are not separated from the house. It's, it's all or nothing. It's a whole entire yard. And so taking the time to not only, um, you know, not go in the bin, but to help put aids together, such as on the right side, you're going to see this panel door, which simply is just, you know, a piece of sheet metal or a piece of tin that, that they've locked in front of that ladder to prevent people from, and even kiddos from climbing and going in. And so just to kind of give a quick summary 
you know, really like ten, Ken talked about and, and I talk about all the time, it starts with really good grain going in the bin. Um, if you have poor grain going in the bin that doesn't get dried properly or has issues to start with, it's not going to get better over time. <laughs> that, that's a huge misconception is that, oh, if I leave it in there, it'll work itself out. It's, it, that's not true. Um, I always say have a plan in place and uh, you know ultimately I, I don't want any I don't want I don't want producers in the bin but I realize that's easier said than done um and and that's why having a plan in place and and talking with you as as agents is really important to to hash that out and figure out what that looks like um and then making sure that you you you're ready to go that fall protection is ready your observer is ready lockout tag out and then realizing that if you make that choice to go in, every action you choose has a consequence to it. All bets are off the table uh, the minute you make that choice. And so to, to finally uh, follow up, I, I guess I ask you and I ask this to the producers, you know, what's, what's your biggest asset on your farm and what's it worth? You know, is it that beautiful, shiny John Deere combine if you're a green fan? How about any quad track fans out there? That that piece of equipment's pretty awesome. For those that are loving livestock like me, uh, you got this million dollar bull uh, that sold a few years ago. That's a pretty big asset to own. I think I'd be scared to own that. And then for any of you, or if it's just me out there, uh, sheep producers, you know, a couple of years ago, we had a $7,000 ram sell at the Hedinger ram sale. And so we've got some pretty big assets and, and a lot of our farmyards, they have entire um, commercial elevator systems now. It's it's not the days where your local elevator was the only elevator. Most Most farm systems now have an entire elevator themselves. And so... We're looking at millions and millions of dollars of equipment here, but the reality is uh, the correct answer is the biggest asset on your farm is, is you. You're the one um, that, that needs to come home safely every night, and there is no amount of equipment or livestock in this world that is worth more than you and your family. Um, and, and how are you going to protect it? And, and that means taking some time to plan, invest in safety. And so with that, um, I will stop and, and take on any questions or comments from the crowd. Well, people are thinking, I'll just add that not only can that avalanche of grain cover you in the bin, uh, we have had one fatality in North Dakota where the farmer was standing outside of the uh, door and the corn come rushing out the door and covered him up, knocked him down and covered him up. So surprisingly, uh, you're not even safe outside the bin. Yeah, and I mean, it's just realizing the the hazards that are there. I mean, we, unfortunately, it takes, it takes mm -hmm. a casual, a bad situation for us to learn and, and that can totally be prevented with more awareness and education. So folks, if you have questions, please reach out to Angie and Ken. They've got a lot of great resources, a lot of great experience, and I would take advantage of that. Mm -hmm.